Welcome back to our Fox News Town Hall here in the gymnasium, the home of the Cardinals at Stevens High School in Claremont, New Hampshire, along with South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. According to the polls, most voters don't know much about the mayor. Uh, here's a closer look at his life and his career. If he wins, he would be the youngest president in U.S. history. I recognize the audacity at age 37 to seek the highest office in the land. But Pete Buttigieg, commonly known as Mayor Pete, has quite the resume. Peter Paul Montgomery Buttigieg was born in South Bend, Indiana in 1982. He caught the attention of Caroline Kennedy when he was a senior in high school, winning the JFK Library Essay Contest, writing about then-Congressman Bernie Sanders. Valedictorian of his high school class, he went to Harvard, then attended Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. He can read or speak eight different languages. Bonjour, je suis Pete Buttigieg de South Bend, Indiana. Ahlan wa sahlan, ana Pete Buttigieg. Salam, Pete Buttigieg asta. He returned home to South Bend and was elected mayor when he was just 29. But he took a leave of absence in 2014, deploying to Afghanistan for more than six months with the Naval Reserves. When he returned, he was re-elected with 80% of the vote. Mayor Pete felt Washington's pull early on. He worked on John Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign and knocked on doors in Iowa for Barack Obama four years later. Now, Mayor Pete has a poll all his own. Can everyone hear, uh, hear Pete when he's talking? A church-going Episcopalian turned millennial internet star, Buttigieg has been making the late-night talk show rounds. But he and his husband, Chaston, live in the same neighborhood where he grew up. If elected, he would not only be the country's youngest president, but also the first openly gay commander-in-chief. I should tell you that the uh, mayor was properly mortified at the pictures of himself as a baby. How'd you get those? <laughs> All right, let's get back to the questions. Patricia Berry is the principal here at Stevens High School. I don't know, should I call you Patricia or Mrs. Barry? Pat is fine, thank you. Oh, well, usually when I got in trouble at the principal's office, I would. <laughs> anyway, Pat. Welcome to Stevens, and thank you for running. Do you think that America is ready for a gay president with a husband? And if not, what do Americans need to know or understand in order for them to reach that comfort level? I do think so. And, and thanks again for having us at the school, by the way. It's, it's been terrific. Um, and I gather it's election eve here. I saw some posters for uh, student elections tomorrow, so I hope those go well. Um, look, when I decided to come out, I was already mayor. Uh, I'd kind of been dragging my feet on figuring out a way to do it. And, and because my job had me so busy, uh, I. I kind of was able to, to not feel like I was missing much by not having a personal life. And by the time I came back from Afghanistan, I realized that had to change, that, that you only get one life and uh, that it was time to get on with things. And that meant I had to uh, be very straightforward with, with my community. And inconveniently, that was an election year. Uh, so I had to think hard about what it would mean for my political future because we just didn't know. It's not like you can do a poll saying if you knew Mayor Pete was gay, would you be less likely to vote for him, right? <laughs> you know, it would kind of tip our hand. And um, so I just wrote it up and put it in the newspaper and waited to see what would happen. And uh, there, there had never been a, a gay uh, mayor or executive in my state. Mike Pence was governor. Indiana obviously not known for being the most pro-equality place on LGBT issues, right? Um, but I thought, you know, whatever happens to my career, this is just something I need to do. And what wound up happening was I got reelected with 80% of the vote in, in my socially conservative community in Indiana. I get that there's, in particular, an older generation of people who grew up conservative who were brought up to reject who I am. But I also see, if nothing else, because uh, I think these are also compassionate people, uh, that anybody can kind of make their way to the right side of history if you just remind them that, that we're all people and that, and that love is one of the best things any of us has to offer. Uh, but I think in this election, Americans are going to vote based on who's going to make them better off. Who's trying to get you a raise? Who's trying to protect your health care? Who's trying to secure your freedom? Who actually has a vision about where America is headed globally and here at home? 
Uh, I really have, you, you don't run for office unless you have some measure of faith and hope in the American people, that, that for all the ups and downs of the political process and all the moments when it delivers a result that's disappointing, that at the end of the day, it's worth trusting voters with that choice and that uh, they will evaluate you for who you really are. Mayor, the next question comes from Gina McAllister. She's a, a businesswoman and in nearby Reading, Vermont. I guess we have to let a Vermonter here into New Hampshire. <laughs> Gina. Hello. Hi. In recent polls, it appears that while you're extremely strong among many voting segments, you haven't managed quite so well to engage minority voters, especially those of color. What are you doing or planning to do to better reach that segment of our population? Thank you. It's a really important strategic but also ethical question for our campaign. It's not just in order to win, but in order to deserve to win. Then I need to make sure my campaign in its supporters as well as in its staff reflects the diversity of our country, of our party, and in particular my generation in our party, which is the most diverse ever. Uh, voters of color where I live, the ones who know me best, helped return me with that big margin to office, but I had years to get to know them. And when we had very divisive issues related to policing that uh, really came between my administration and the black community in my first few months in office, it took years of engagement and uh, policy work and, and all kinds of things that we did together to build up that trust. Uh, we don't have years to earn the confidence of voters in the primary electorate. Frankly, voters who feel like they've been let down by Republican and Democratic presidents alike. And the challenge for us is, uh, I don't have the advantage of having been famous for years and years. Uh, and when you're not somebody that people feel like they've known for a long time, nor yourself a person of color. You gotta work extra hard to get to know folks, but that's exactly what we're doing. In our travels, uh, not just in the town halls and the speeches and the kind of stuff you see on TV, but uh, sometimes behind closed doors in private, we're engaging in a process of uh, listening and speaking with activists, with faith leaders, uh, with community leaders, elected officials uh, from communities of color to make sure that uh, they are able, not just I hope to support my campaign, but also to shape it by letting me know what things they believe are most of concern. And I think that's how, with less time than I had to do it back home, but uh, with a lot of energy and a lot of goodwill going into it, that's how I believe I can earn that support. Mayor, I, I want to, if I may, drill down on this a little bit, yeah. because people have been struck, uh, particularly, not particularly here in New Hampshire, but in places where there is a very large African-American population like South Carolina, how few people of color show up at your rallies. We had a Fox News poll that just came out this week, and it showed that among people of color, you have less than 1% support as opposed to Joe Biden, who has 38%. I understand he's been around for a long time. He was Joe, uh, Barack Obama's vice president. But how do you break through to them, particularly compared to one, uh, other candidates who are of color themselves, and somebody like Joe Biden, who has such a long record in the African American community. I mean, you, you're not, I think you'd agree, you are not going to win the Democratic nomination unless you can build up support among African Americans. There of course, that's one reason it's such an important priority. But again, right. it's not just in order to win, it's in order to deserve to win. And uh, I believe that my record, the work that we did in our community in order to bring people together and serve uh, minority residents in particular, is a very good record that is competitive with uh, any of the other folks on that list. But I'm not famous, uh, or I seem to be getting famous, but uh, uh, I don't have those years where people feel like they've gotten to know me. And so it shows But, but I mean, if I may just interrupt, on the other hand, you have had no problem breaking through with a lot of white voters, mm -hmm. but in the African-American community, not so much. Mm -hmm. So there are the folks who are going to automatically find their way to my events, to my campaign, to my rallies, and then there are the people who will not hear my message. Uh, unless I reach out to them. And I think that's particularly true of black and brown voters who are just skeptical of people who come along uh, seemingly out of nowhere. And so it's why we've worked so hard to make sure that as we go into this summer, in our outreach and in our substance, that we're speaking to voters who are concerned with what the next president can do to deal with, for example, the glaring racial inequities that we see in our society. Uh, it's not just the criminal justice system, although that's one of the ones that rightly gets talked about the most. It's entrepreneurship, it's health, it's education, it's housing. And I think voters are expecting to hear what you're going to do about it. I'm very much looking forward to continuing to engage with voters on why our plan is the one that makes the most sense. 
Another question, Colby Clough is 19 and works at a local grocery store. Colby. Hello, Mayor Pete. My Hi. question is, what is your opinion, <clears throat> if any, about the Democratic Party possibly impeaching Trump and making it so people think twice about voting for a Democrat in 2020? Hmm. Well, I think that if you look at the conduct of this administration and the conduct of this president, there's no question that it is beyond the pale morally. To put it politely, it is legally questionable, too. And uh, he may well have done things that deserve impeachment, but that's for Congress to decide. Uh, my role, not as a member of Congress, but as a candidate, is to try to get a new president in a different way. Uh, in other words, I think that the thing that would really put an end, not just to this presidency, but to the divisiveness, to the corruption, to the behavior, and to the cover that congressional Republicans, many of whom you can just tell, know better, but they're giving it cover because they think they have to politically. The best way, in my view, to change that equation is for there to be an enormous defeat for this president and what he represents at the ballot box. <laughs> Again, I would like to just pursue that a little bit with you, Mayor. Let's talk about, and, I, and I'm less talking about policies than the dynamic of running against Donald Trump, because yeah. as we saw in 2016, he is a formidable candidate and a very unconventional candidate. Right. He's already making fun of your name. He's making fun of your looks, comparing you to Alfred E. Newman. Uh, if you say what me worry right now, I could, I'll give you $10, by the way. <laughs> But ser seriously, how, how, do you, how would you deal with him? Because that's what, one of the concerns, I think, for Democrats. Who can be on the debate stage and who, how would you handle the insults and the attacks and the tweets and all of that? The tweets are, I don't care. <laughs> And that gets a lot of applause here. The fact is, it's a very effective way for him to reach tens of millions of Americans. Well, it's a very effective way to command the attention of the media. And uh, well, I think that, that, you know, we need to make sure that we're, we're changing the channel from this show that he's created. Because what matters, and I get it, look, it's mesmerizing. It's hard for anybody to look away. Me too. It is, it is the nature of grotesque things that you can't look away. <laughs> um, But every time we're looking at the show and the latest tweet and the latest silly insult, uh, what we're not looking at is the fact that we're the ones trying to get you a raise and they're the ones blocking it. We're the ones trying to preserve your health care and they're the ones trying to take it away. Uh, we are the ones who are actually prepared to deliver on something like paid family leave and they're against it. Their positions, as a general rule, are unpopular. And if we focus on what's going to happen in your life, in other words, if we make it less about him and more about you, Paradoxically, I think that's actually the best way to defeat him. Now, the other thing we've got to do is we've got to find people where they are. You know, a lot of folks in my party were critical of me for even doing this uh, with Fox News. And, and I've, I, I've heard that. <laughs> and, and I get where that's coming from, especially when you see what goes on with some of the opinion hosts on this network. I mean, when you've got Tucker Carlson saying that immigrants make America dirty, when you've got uh, Laura Ingram comparing detention centers with children in cages to summer camps, summer camps, then there is a reason why anybody has to swallow hard and think twice before participating in this media ecosystem. But I also believe that even though some of those hosts are not always there in good faith, I think a lot of people tune into this network uh, who do it in good faith. And, and there are a lot of Americans who my party can't blame if they are ignoring our message because they will never hear it if we don't go on and talk about it. And so it's why, whether it's going into uh, the viewership of Fox News or whether geographically it's going into places uh, where Democrats haven't been seen much, I think we've got to find people where they are, not change our values, but update our vocabulary so that we're truly connecting with Americans from coast to coast. All right, Mayor, we've got to take a break here. Coming up, we'll turn to foreign policy and what the mayor learned from his deployment in Afghanistan. As we continue our Fox News Town Hall with Mayor Pete Buttigieg live from Claremont, New Hampshire.